All right, so let's uh, talk about assignment one. Assignment one uh, relates to the game of Go. And the game of Go is a very old, uh, very interesting game with relatively simple rules, but it has some kind of a nuance and some complexity. And for the purpose of explanations, I'm, I'm using a pro program which is called uh, Sego. Sigoban. It's a. Uh, uh, this program is available on. Um, oops. Sorry. Uh, on many platforms, I have it on Mac, but it is available on uh, on Windows as well. And it's it is kind of a simple editor for specifying the state of the of the game. And it uses SGF file format such that you can read and write SGF uh, files from it and to it. So I will uh, create a simple uh, seven by seven uh, board, and I will call the white play white stones white and black black, and then we'll have the board, and we will be able to generate SGF file with a specific uh, board state. So the the game has those uh, intersection points and the freedom points. So if you have a stone placed, for example, on a C5 um, coordinate. So again, about the coordinate system, um, the most of the uh, systems, they use uh, letters on the uh, horizontal and numbers on the vertical um, uh, grid and the initial point is uh, A1, which is the lower left corner. You will notice that in SGF file format, they use letters only. So this this corner is called AA. Uh, so they use letters in both horizontal and vertical. And the upper left corner is the initial uh, corner, right? So it doesn't matter. What matters is that you follow the SGF specification and you use the same coordinate system as the SGF file such that there is consistency. Um, okay, so let me delete that stone and talk a little bit about that, that stone. So if we have C5 uh, and we treat it as a group, you will see that this intersection, this, this, and this are the freedom points for this stone, right? So if we, um, if I change, sorry. If I use the, uh, If I do this, then the white stone only has one uh, freedom point, which is the B6. And then if I place a new stone on B6, what will happen is the uh, C6 white stone is gonna get captured, right? So if I place the stone here, this stone disappears from the state of the board because it is captured. So the, the state of the game consists of this, of the board the stones on the board and the kind of a captured stones, which are or like in the two players accounts because they have been kind of taken prisoners. Um, so the ability to deal with the, um, with the state of the board includes dealing with the board itself and the stones and the captures. Um, it also, if I have, let's say I have a situations like this, and I want to make, okay, let's make situation like this. And I want to make a wide move, then making a move in the C6 is now illegal because that move doesn't capture anything and the white stone would not be able to breathe. Like it doesn't have any freedom points, right? So I cannot place a stone here. So the, uh, the game that we simulate should recognize illegal moves 
uh, same I cannot place white stone in any positions that already have or have stones. Um, and I cannot place a stone in a position where the, the stone placement is illegal according to the rules of the game, right? So I can place um, I can place the stone here, but I cannot place it here and I cannot place a black stone anywhere where the stones already exist. And yeah, I, I think you get the you get the point. So let me just do one more thing. So if I let's say yep. Yes, so black can place here because then those um one, two, three, four, six stones form a group. And they kind of um have this, 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 and this as a freedom point. So the uh, um, uh, horizontal and vertical lines form the points we where the group has the freedom points. Uh, the this point this point doesn't relate to the to 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 this group uh, because it's not uh, horizontal or vertical; it's diagonal. So diagonal points don't kind of count for anything. Uh, but horizontal and vertical points do count. So if if we consider this this board, we have two groups. We have a group in this area with those six stones, and we have a group of one stone here. And this one stone has one, two, three, three, four freedom points, right? Uh, it, it it has kind of a four points where this stone breathe, breathes from. Uh, and this group has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven freedom points. So if we were to represent this state of the game, we would say, yep, that's the state of the game. The, the, the stones are here in those locations. There are no captures yet or whatever. And then we have two groups and one group has seven freedom points and one group one group of six stones have six or seven freedom points and one group of one stone has four if i placed a stone here and here now we have two groups again uh the same group as we used to have and we have a new group with three stones and one two three four five six seven freedom points right you get it Okay, so that's um, that's the basics. Uh, if we have, uh, let me draw something. So if I have group like this, okay. Um, you, usually, what we do is we kind of play some. Um, uh, we play the game, of course, but for practice, we often have a problem. And the problem re requires like a single move or a se sequence of moves to solve, to be solved, right? So for example, I can have, um, I can have a situation like this. Um, and I can say, okay, so let's do this. And I, I say, uh, e e Ignore the, the middle group, ignore this group here. Let's consider a problem with those two stones, right? So if I consider the problem with those two stones and white, there is now white move. And the problem is how to capture a black stone, right? Um, yeah, let me clean this. Such, such that we don't get confused. So now it's a white move and we say, um, we say, where should white go to capture the black stone? And the solution is, you know, the white should go to A A6, right? Um, because if white goes to A A6, then uh, 
then the black stone is captured. And this problem, uh, so let's clear that. So now this problem is like a particular set of, of stones on the board and a single move which achieves something, right? So the single move is um, is this move uh, and it captures the, the stone. White can go anywhere else and the the black stone continues to live. But if black if white goes here, the black stone is captured, right? Um, so now we have uh, a, a little bit more advanced situation where we say, what are the other similar um, board co configurations such that it's exactly the same problem, right? Um, so if we consider symmetries and if we consider um, um, the situation of the board, we see that we have similar situation with, oops, sorry, uh, with, those four corners and white stone being either here or here, right? So I, I do kind of some random things. So we have those additional six configurations, which are kind of symmetric and the same as this one, right? So it's either this or this or this or this and so on. You see that? You see the, the symmetries and that the, the same problem is kind of repeated, reproduced in each of the corners with white either being here or here, right? It, it's kind of a symmetric. So this is what uh, a more advanced version of the assignment is to recognize if the two board situations. So if I give, um, let's say you have a board like this, and then you have another board, which is like this. Are those two problems the same or those two problems are different? And taking into account the symmetries and translations and kind of a movement, those two problems are the same. Because the two problems are on the diagonal, you need to place a white stone to kind of solve that problem, right? So that's one example. Another example is if I have those two stones. So I have a one group which has one, two, three, four, five, six freedom points. Uh, is this uh, group different to this group? And the answer is no. Again, it's, it's just translation of the two stones which are positioned here into here and they are kind of the same. They represent the same thing. You, strictly speaking, you may say, no, they are different because uh, those two stones are only one stone away from the edge, whereas those two stones have more distance to the edge, but we're ignoring it, right? We only considering symmetries and kind of translations as long as the count of the freedom points doesn't change. Um, so we're making, we're making that assumption that as long as the freedom points of the um, of the groups don't change, we consider the two groups being exactly the same. So now this, like ignore those two stones. So those two stones are the same as those two stones. Okay, so I I took some notes to remember what I need to talk about in, in my spec. And those two, um, th those two symmetries that I talked about is this uh, point here. So we want to check if two board states are kind of isomorphic and we're using it uh, by man maintaining the exact number of, um, of the of freedom degrees, right? For the groups. So this is the, the situations which I talked uh, about with the, with the symmetries. Um, let me draw, uh, so let me draw a board. Imagine a situation like this. So now if I move this situation one up 
left, right, or down, it will be different because the white stones will have a different degree of freedom, right? Uh, this situation on the board is unique uh, because it only has one placement. It cannot be placed anywhere else because then it would touch the edge, right? Or on the seven by seven board. If we use nine by nine board, we can move it a little bit up and down because then we will not change the degrees of freedom, okay? All right, so in this situation, uh, is the white move in the middle legal or illegal? It is legal because when I when a player makes this white move, uh, even though it seems this position doesn't have any degrees of freedom to breathe, when the move is executed, uh, the black stones actually get captured and then the white stone lives, right? So the representation of the board and the representation of the game has to allow legal moves and this move is legal, right? Uh, so, ay, ay, ay. All right, so again, this move in the middle is a legal move and it captures those four black stones because black on the board is represented by four groups. They are not connected. Those four stones are not connected because the connection is only by horizontal or vertical uh, edges, right? Not diagonally. So even though those two stones are next to each other diagonally, they are not connected in the terms of the rules of the game. So according to the rules of the game, those two are separate groups. And this group has one degree of freedom, the middle. This group has also one degree of freedom, one degree of freedom, and one degree of freedom, right? So all those four groups, they all use this middle space as the freedom point. Um, the, this white stone has one, two, three. Uh, if I place a white stone in the middle, the four black stones get captured. Can I place a black stone in the middle? No, I cannot because then it becomes a single group and that single group doesn't have any degrees of freedom and cannot breathe, right? So the black stone here is an illegal move, but white stone here is a legal move. All right, there is one more uh, rule in, in Go, which is um, sometimes slightly different depending on the rules that are being played, but in most of the rules, uh, if you have a move, so if, if we have a single move that uh, repeats the previous sequence, that move becomes illegal. So that, that is uh, to prevent p players playing like move, 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 which don't change anything, right? So to prevent the situation of a move being kind of a mirror image of the previous move, and that then uh, nothing happening, we have a rule says, if there is a move which repeats just the previous move, then the player cannot play that move. Um, that uh, situation, let me just quickly find, um, find that situation. So, We have this board state. So now if white plays in the red circle, the black stone one is get, is gonna get captured, right? So if black, uh, if white plays here, the black stone is captured, but then the white stone will be here and we will have a symmetric situation for the black. So then the black could play in this position to capture the white stone, right? And then those two play, those two moves would be kind of repeated indefin infinitely, and the two players will be capturing one stone per move. So that situation is kind of prevented by a rule which says, if white played here in the red circle and the black stone get captured, black for one move cannot play here because that would be kind of the move which was just played before. Um, so black has to play somewhere else. And, but once black played somewhere else, 
in the next turn of black, if that spot is still free, black can recapture that white stone again, right? And then the red circle for white becomes an illegal move because that would mean it's the, the symmetric move again, right? So there is this kind of a complication in the board state because you have to remember if there is a co-fight or not. Because if there is a co-fight, then this red circle for white is an illegal move. If, if black just put one here and captured a white stone from here, then white cannot play place here because that becomes an illegal move, okay? So those are all, all the rules which refer to the state of the board groups and kind of uh, legal and illegal moves, right? So normally the stones can be placed anywhere on the board with those limitations of the freedom uh, and with the limitations of the core. So this this is this is uh, this situation on the board is is called core, uh, and it means if it's a white move and black didn't place this one stone here in the previous move, then white can play in the red circle, but if black played here and captured a white stone from here, then white cannot re -put, replace this white stone again with the next move. It has to wait one move. Um, what happens if we have this situation? So let, let's kind of re redo it. What happens if we have this situation here? Um, and black plays here. Can white do, can white place here? Yes, white can, right? So white can do this, but black cannot do this in the next move. It has to wait one move to be able to place black here, right? But if black did this, then white cannot put white back here in the, in the next move. So there is a bit of a state, right? So you have to keep uh, for the call, you have to keep one move back state to check if the move is legal or not legal. Uh, but it only refers to the situation where there was a capture. So again, if black plays here and in black's move there is no capture, there is no call, there is no state uh, maintenance uh, required. But if white plays here, there is a capture and then you have to remember what was captured because if black wants to place here and that was the board situation just a move ago then this becomes an illegal move all right so there is one more simple complication uh let me explain this one so let's say let's say we have two stones and white white plays here can white play here? Yes, because there was in previous move there was no capture. Okay, so so let's say it's a black move. Black plays here, and now white goes, and white can play here because it's a legal move and captures those two stones. Can black play here? Yes, because it is not a symmetric situation from the move before, because the move before had two black stones here, not one, right? So can black play here? Yes, black can play here and recapture that white, white stone, right? Because the situation is not symmetric. Um, so that's what the legal and illegal moves are. Uh, and you have to follow the legal and illegal moves rules to represent the board and represent the moves, right? So what me as a customer want from you to implement is I want you to implement the representation of the board internally and in, inside the computer data structures such that you can represent the state of the game and you can represent the legal and illegal moves and you can add new moves to the state of the board such that you can the user can say put a black stone uh, d5 and then you update the state of the board and then you say update the the white uh, here and you will do this and then you will say put the black here and you will do this and all those captures will be kind of maintained you will maintain who captured what and then you will say okay put the white here 
and then put the black here and then you will say put the white here and this is a legal move and then if i say put the black here you say no that's an illegal move because it's the call right you have to wait one move to be able to put black here so if black plays here and let's say uh sorry um white plays here then the black can do this but then oh sorry uh, black can do this and then white tries to do this and you say no that is an illegal move right because it's a call again so that's the uh part where i would like you to do the um where is my lab notes here so represent the state of the game represent the stones of the on the board represent the groups uh, and I would like the program to be able to answer so, some questions. So, for example, how many white groups I have on the board, uh, how many degrees of freedom each group has, right? Um, I would like the program to load the, um, the state of the board from the SGF format. SGF format is pretty complicated. It, it is because it represents not only the state of the game, it represents all the moves of the game as well. So we only are considering the state of the board. We're not considering all the moves. We don't care about the tree and the graph for the moves, right? We kind of ignoring that part of the SGF file format. Um, if you are kind of an A-level student and you want to do something extra, you can take that into account. But strictly speaking, that's not required. Like, I don't really need that. It would be nice to have, but you, you don't have to do this, right? So the SGF file format has kind of a two parts. The first part is like, what is the current state, the initial state of the board? And then what are all the moves? We only care about the initial state of the board, not about the moves. Um, and once the program, because the program will have an API and I can use the program to update the state of the board, I should be able to save the new state of the board again as initial state in a new SGF format. Um, so updating the, uh, the moves, uh, ability to detect illegal moves. So the program should prevent players to play illegal moves. So the program should allow two human players to play against each other and then do the accounting for the captures for both players and prevent a player making illegal move. So if a player wants to put a stone in a position which is legal, the program should prevent that. Um, and ability to capture stones and account for captures. That's what I said. So it, it is basically the program for two human players to play a Go game, right? And for the initial um, requirements, a simple keyboard entry and kind of a terminal printout is sufficient. So similar, similarly to what we did for lab four, that, that's sufficient, but that's kind of like a very basic, right? Um, me as a customer, I would like to be able to play with a mouse. So I would like to actually see the board and not only see the kind of um, descriptions of where things are, uh, I would like to see it kind of visually. Uh, and that's why we were kind of diving into SGL and trying uh, SDL and, and trying to do graphical interface such that we could do that. We will see how it goes. Uh, maybe we use something else. Uh, I am planning to do a little bit more labs related to doing kind of a GUI or textual UI in uh, Haskell. So we'll see, but um, the initial intention was to do it with SDL2 and to have it kind of on a graphical interface. Um, but for those of you for, for whom that's too hard, yeah, just stick to terminal and stick to just keyboard entry, like, you know, AA or AB, and then you place the stones, update the state and, and so on. So then if you do the textual UI or, um, graphical UI, then you sort of, that that's where the level of the assignment is kind of intended to be. Uh, and then for those of you who are more ambitious, then uh, that's what I talked about, those symmetries and the kind of recognition if the two board states are the same. Um, 
by counting the groups and then doing the translations and checking if the two groups uh, have the same amount of freedom and are kind of a, uh, translatable between the two locations. So it, translation is moving it on the board. Uh, rotation is rotating it on the board. And then symmetries, uh, sometimes you like, um, for example, so let's consider So if I have a situation like this, right? So translation would be moving it, uh, moving it down or sideways or diagonally. So to get the same situation on the board uh, by doing translations uh, and rotations, I would have, um, you know, this. And now with the rotation by 90 degrees, I could have those two, right? Um, this one, uh, so, so th this is a rotation by 180 degrees. By 90 degrees, I would have potentially those two. But there are some symmetries which are not achieved by simple uh, rotations and translations but they kind of relate, like you have to flip it, right? Um, so then the, the the symmetry is kind of not related to, not convertible to rotations and translations. You kind of need to kind of uh, flip it, like do a mirror image uh, by some uh, isomorphic point of the group. So that's what, um, uh, let's say, I have something like, um, yeah, I would have to think a little bit because this shape, you can also achieve all the symmetries by uh, translations and rotations. Uh, but there are situations where translation and rotation is not enough. You kind of need to do a mirror image. I can post uh, an example later. So anyway, this is kind of a more advanced, um, this is the more advanced, requirement, being able to recognize those uh, translations and uh, rotations. Okay, so then uh, there are some um, aspects which I would like to have for the computer to be able to do as well. So for some simple Go problems, I would like the computer by doing an exhaustive search to find a move which solves a particular problem. So for example, uh, what is a single move uh, that eliminates the most black stones, which captures the most black stones from the current situation, right? So if I have a board state and I can put one white stone somewhere and it captures the most uh, black stones, what is that position, right? If there are two positions which capture white, one black stone, then I would have a set, right? Uh, so either a set or a single move. And then what is a single white move that extends the most the degrees of freedom of a given group, right? So those are kind of a two simple examples of a, an AI thinking for making kind of a computer generated moves to be suggested to the player, right? So we kind of trying to make a simple Go board game play engine for two humans to play with each other plus adding some kind of a hints for the players to get from the computer suggest, suggesting some, some things. So those are just two examples. Uh, normally um, in the specs, like if I gave you the, like this is not a spec, this is just my notes. The spec is what I told you, right? You have to write your specs yourself. Uh, but you, of course you can be inspired by, by those notes. Um, but you can specify additional uh, things that are easy to implement for the computer to suggest to the human player, right? Those are just two examples. And based on your inventiveness, you kind of uh, get a little bit extra extra points, right? So me as a customer, normally I would be exhaustive 
like I would be exhaustive in uh, listing all the features that I would like to have. But because um, me as a teacher, I want to give you an ability to kind of be a little bit creative. I don't want to be exhaustive. I want to only list the kind of a minimal requirements. And then you can kind of add new things, which make you kind of a BNA and a student, right? Uh, so you can kind of uh, come up with something that is easy for you to add and say, yeah, I can add this thing and th that thing kind of uh, adds to the to the spec, right? You, you get the idea. So this is not an exhaustive list, it's just examples. So now, what is not clear and what you need to ask me? Yep. Yeah, I would say those are kind of a triple A level requirements. So no, <laughs> no for the assignment. But if you want to add something like that, feel free to do this. But it's more than A, like you don't need to have that. Yeah, uh, the board is white and black. So for most colorblind people, that's kind of fine. Uh, if someone is blind, then that's super hard to do. <laughs> so then it's definitely triple A level. Uh, so I would say no. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? So according to the games of the Go game, I, I'm not introducing anything new, right? So it's, it's basically the, the rules as in Go. Uh, but what I iterated over is that you should kind of uh, allow legal moves and you should prevent illegal moves and you should keep accounting for the extra things that we need to have in the game, like captures and the core. Um, other than that, it is relatively simple. For the SGF, we're making the restriction that we don't deal with SGF full specification. We only deal with SGF specification for the initial state of the board. Um, the initial state of the board is re re reasonably simple to parse because it basically is B or W representing B or white with the coordinates of where the stones are. And you just have a list of all the black and white stones on the board. And they, you may assume they are legal positions. So you should not have an SGF file with an illegal state of the board um, such that uh, a, a given group doesn't have any degrees of freedom. It, I didn't actually check if that is possible to have an SGF file which has an illegal state of the board, but it is not your problem. So if, if there is an SGF file which has an illegal state, you will read it and you will have an illegal state uh, of the board initially. Um, so, so we will deal with it. But I think that is not possible. Um, you, you will, we will know once, once we finish this. Uh, and for the moves, we don't care. So normally the Go problems are represented as an initial state of the board, plus the moves which solve it, plus the moves that don't solve it, right? So you usually have kind of a three moves uh, sequences and some of the uh, moves kind of solve the puzzle and some of the moves don't solve the puzzle. They are kind of wrong. Uh, we don't deal with that. It's kind of uh, too complex for us to be dealing with it in this iteration, so we don't do that. Um, and then the rest are trying to, because the, the whole assignment with the GUI and with the symmetries and uh, translations, and uh, it, it is quite complicated. It, it is uh, quite complex, but don't get discouraged that you have to do everything. You don't have to do everything. You can kind of uh, do uh, those initial things uh, and that is sufficient to pass kind of the assignment um, by having the state, having the state updates, and having the recognition of legal and illegal state and the count, counting of the freedoms. Um, that, that's what the minimal requirement is. Um, the, the, all the rest is kind of for people who are more ambitious, right? Um, okay, so other questions? Do I care about the memory footprint? No, I don't. I'm, I'm not running it on a memory limited devices. I will not run it on the Apple Watch. You don't care about memory usage. <laughs>
Do I care about speed? No, I don't care about speed neither. If the computer needs to think. Uh, okay, I do care about speed. So if the computer needs to think more than 30 seconds about anything, then I consider it unacceptable. But up to 30 seconds, yes, I can live with this. Can the program crash? No, that's unacceptable. The program should not crash. The kittens will die if the program crashes. Should the program be resilient to stupidity of the user entering rubbish or entering illegal things? Yes, the program has to be resilient to user stupidity. <laughs> Should there be undo function? So if a user makes a mistake, should the program allow undo? Yeah, maybe. It's a kind of a triple A level. If you add it, that's great, but you don't have to have it. So undo, no, not necessarily. Should there be a human versus computer option to play? Yeah, that would be nice, <laughs> even if it just random moves, but legal moves, of course. Should there be computer versus computer? Maybe, yeah, but also not required. All right, so if there are no questions, um, and you will have questions later, then post them into the um, assignment issue tracker, and then everybody will see the question and everybody will see my answer, right? Uh, if the questions are related to the requirements, uh, to the functional requirements, if the questions are related to non-functional requirements, uh, then it's up to you to decide and write them down in the in the spec yourself. Uh, if the questions are related to the game of Go, you can post them into the course because that that theme is sort of a course-wide. Uh, it relates to some of the labs and some some of the assignments. Um, yep, I think that's pretty much covers. So what I will do is I will stop it now.